Hello, and welcome to Dunking. You're just in time for part two of my response to Dr. Miano's response to Dr. Sweatman's paper on Gobekli Tepe's Pillar 43. Yes, it's quite a convoluted mess to get there. Before we get too far into this, I do have a small correction to make for my last one, but it's kind of important. I mentioned that I had tweeted uh, Dr. Miano and asked him his opinion on archaeoastronomy, if he felt that it was like a viable field of study or if it was just a bunch of woo, and he hadn't responded at the time of me recording. Um, when I was editing, he did respond, and for some reason I missed it, probably was arguing with somebody in breaks of editing and didn't notice it in amongst of 28 different comments or something. That, that happens every now and again, and that's my bad. His answer wasn't very clarifying. He told me to watch his video that I'd already seen that didn't really clarify a whole lot as to what his view, his view was on archaeoastronomy. But he did respond to me, so I have to say that that was an error on my part saying that he didn't. He did. To give you a quick recap, you don't have to watch the first video, but I highly suggest you do. The link's down there in the description. And um, it basically goes through and shows that Dr. Miano doesn't really understand the basic premise of archaeoastronomy. He understands like the idea behind it, but he doesn't understand how it's done to the point where he thinks that a mathematician doesn't have credentials in that field, when in reality, a mathematician is like one of the core fields that comes in there. They're, as we'll see in this one, they're actually what makes this science and Dr. Miano will agree with that without really realizing that he agrees with that but he'll say it point blank. Bear with me, you'll see. And so the reason that I asked Dr. Miano what his feelings were on archaeoastronomy is because he seems to be attacking archaeoastronomy in general as he attacks Dr. Sweatman's paper. Which would be fine, but he just doesn't seem to say that he's attacking archaeoastronomy, he just says this paper sucks, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But the methodology that he's attacking is the basic methodology of archaeoastronomy. As I've demonstrated in the first video, and we will continue to demonstrate here. Um, I suppose we should just get going, so let's do the rest of this uh, stuff here. Okay, so if we compare the animal symbols at the top of the pillar next to these sunset symbols with their corresponding equinoxes or solstices, we find that this bending bird symbol looks just like or a lot like Pisces, that this animal symbol, which could be some kind of charging gazelle or ibex, looks a bit like Gemini at the winter solstice, and this downcrawling creature looks a bit like constellation Virgo, corresponding to the spring equinox. The first one kind of matches, but the other two, mm, no, I don't think so. What do you think? But there really is no point in arguing over that, because whatever animals they are, he would still say they represent Pisces, Gemini, and Virgo. And if he's honest, he'll admit that, because he needs them to be those constellations for his date to work. The symbols are irrelevant to the thesis. And just as we jump into part two immediately, Dr. Miano shows that he doesn't understand the basic methodology of archaeoastronomy. Dr. Sweatman's hypothesis is that the, basically that the Gobekli Tepe Pillar 43, that that's Bulger Stone, is a clock. Each one of those uh, handbag signals represents a uh, solstice or an equinox. It's a sunrise. And that the main body of the pillar represents the fourth solstice or equinox, the one that's important. Um, you could think of the main body as the 12 on a clock and the other ones as the three other cardinal points. That's the thinking basically behind this. So, when Dr. Sweatman says the vulture, he has Scorpio to start with. And then he has the vulture that somewhat resembles Sagittarius, enough that you could put the position of the wing and it looks of the sun in the wings and it looks pretty good. But then you look at the three sunrises or sunsets, and one of them does match very well to Pisces, right? Like that V symbol is a very good match to the old Greek symbol. So he's not out in the weeds. So I read from this paper in the last video, but I think it's important that I read from this again because it's important that you guys understand that this is standard methodology in archaeoastronomy. A military metaphor is especially fitting here. Starting from the available evidence, the research strategies to identify a bridgehead that links some observed feature of the civilization under study with those of a more familiar culture, like the Greeks with Scorpio, for example. Such leak may be provided by similarities in the respective material artifacts or buildings, by evidence of common religious forms and cultural practices, or by considerations of cultural and geographical continuity. Once an adequate bridgehead is available, the remaining work consists in a transfer of a system of meanings of the familiar culture onto the description of the target civilization, revising and filling those aspects of the source culture that are either inapplicable or missing. In this way, an analogy 
an analogy with a more familiar civilization can become a source of new insights and hypotheses about a people whose intentions and worldview would otherwise completely escape us. Entirely escape us, but I'm a pyramid. I can't help but to like misrepresent people, right? Anyway, my point is, is that with archaeoastronomy, the, the point, the way that they do it is they like find something like Scorpio that allows them a bridgehead that starts, right? Here's a touchstone, here's a basis, so we go from there and build off that. Now, the fact that Pisces seems to match pretty well gives him two out of four of those symbols that are pretty much identifiable, not with just any old pattern of stars, but with the traditional Greek constellations. And that's important, and we, I want to talk about that as we go along, but keep that in mind. We're not talking about just any old pattern of stars. If I just vomit a pattern of stars out, I can make any fucking symbol I want, right? And this all happens at around 10,950 BC, more or less, to within a few hundred years. So we get that date by lining up the sun relative to constellation Sagittarius in this software, this is um, Stellarium software. You can download Stellarium yourself and, and check everything I say. So at 10,950 BC, the sun is about halfway between this sort of head and wing on the constellation Sagittarius. And therefore, it's probably quite close to the date if this is representing a date on pillar 43. I downloaded Stellarium and it shows that in September, the time of the summer solstice in those days, the sun was between the head and wing of Sagittarius between 11,700 and 10,500 BCE. That's a 1,200 year span. And since Dr. Swetman has already indicated that the positions of the symbols on the pillar are approximate, we can't narrow it down any further than that. In the paper, they said their date was accurate to within 250 years. Here in the video, he widened it to 500 years. According to Stellarium, which he claims to have used, the date is more like 11,100 BCE, plus or minus 600 years. Whoa, I don't know if you caught that, but it's pretty glaring. So I'm going to attribute it to Dr. Miano's ignorance when it comes to astronomy, because this is like... Let's go ahead and look at, at, at the difference in position of the stars in Dr. Miano's 1,200 years, the difference in position of the sun relative to Sagittarius. <sighs> That is not at all like what Dr. Sweatman shows, which is why Dr. Sweatman shows the traditional asterism, the lines, not some artistic representation of pictures. Those lines give you a very confining place to put the sun in. You've just got it drifting off into fucking space there, man. So I'm going to say that Dr. Miano is like... I, he's not a potholer 54. I'm, I'm not willing to attribute that that level of like complete intellectual dishonesty to Dr. Miano. I, I think I think that he's a little quick to jump the gun when he attacks pseudoscience, but I like, honestly, I like a lot of his content. I think he's an okay guy. Dude, some of his shorts are goddamn hilarious. You should check some of them out. They'll really make you laugh if, if you're a little bit on the... I think that some of the pyramid types like myself, some of the guys on our side of the fence go a little too far. There's a lot of stuff that Miano makes that's pretty hilarious. But times like this, it's like, dude, what the hell are you talking about? There's 1,200 years that <laughs> the thing's going to have moved like so noticeable that it... <clears throat> There are four dates to choose from. One is today's date, more or less, which is the one that Graham Hancock proposed corresponding to the winter solstice. We propose that instead it's the summer solstice that's represented here at around 10,950 BC. That makes a lot more sense to us because that date is far closer to the actual construction date of Gebekli Tepe. In fact, it precedes the radiocarbon date of Enclosure D by about a thousand years or so. From the numerous assumptions already discussed, he draws the conclusion that the only solstice or equinox that this could represent is the summer solstice. Why? Because if this is a date, the solstice or equinox with this configuration of constellations that provides a date closest to the date of Gobekli Tepe is the summer solstice around 10,950 BCE. Now in my last video, I pointed out a few times where Dr. Miano employed tactics that you could never do in a peer-reviewed published paper. And yes, I understand he's a YouTuber and can use different tactics, but some of these are a little bit underhanded for science. And this is a perfect example where 
Dr. Sweatman point blank says that is what's most compelling to him, that they think, him and his colleague think, that what makes the most sense to them. Here's the words he says exactly. Listen again. We propose that instead it's the summer solstice that's represented here at around 10,950 BC. That makes a lot more sense to us because... Okay, what makes the most sense to him? But how does Dr. Miano portray that? He draws the conclusion that the only solstice or equinox that this could represent is the summer solstice. When did he say it was the only possible thing? He's, he is subconsciously stripping his veneer of academic authority away that I speak about all the time. He is making him, he's making him take off his lab coat in your mind without even telling you so much by making it look like he's employing non-scientific language, when in reality, Dr. Miano was the one attributing that to him as a straw man. But it's still a thousand years removed. Think about it, more than a thousand years, not a hundred, a thousand. He believes the people who built this Stone Age ritual center remembered how the stars were arranged over a thousand years earlier and wanted to record them because they believed the date was important to remember, even though it was so imprecise. Could have happened anywhere within a 1200 year period. And even though we have discovered no settlement here from 10,950 BCE, Dr. Swetman is assuming that the people of Gobekli Tepe recorded the stars as they would have been seen right here in this spot at a time when no one lived here. First of all, as we just discussed, no, it's not a 1200 year window. It is much narrower than that. But in addition to that, Dr. Miano was saying there's no way that people could have measured the sun from this location and done astronomy from this location because there's no evidence of a settlement there. There's evidence of multiple Gobekli Tepe type of things all over the place in that area spanning about a thousand years or so, but don't count any of those because there's no evidence that they built a house at Gobekli Tepe. So every morning they weren't there to measure where the sun rose. What happened is, is they, they would hike off about a thousand miles so they couldn't see the sunrise in Gobekli Tepe and they would hike back that thousand miles after the sun rose because that, that way they couldn't do the astronomy. Then they went around building their megaliths and they would hike back that thousand miles so they couldn't see the sun in the same spot. Or maybe they could have done astronomy there while they were building the damn place. I mean, that's maybe a possibility. Man, I should be an archeologist. And Dr. Sweatman's hypothesis is basically surrounding the Younger Dryas impact, that this is a memory of the comet hitting the Earth. So, yes, it's the kind of thing that would be remembered for a very long time, especially if it was the kind of thing that, like, became the beginning of a calendar, maybe, or like the cutoff point, like the birth of Christ, right? So you, you change things then it would absolutely be something they would remember for a very long time. So that whole, oh, it's been a thousand years argument, that, that's absurd, all right? Th this is the kind of thing they would remember for a very, very, very long time. I dare say we might still be talking about it today. I think we need to face the possibility that it may not even have been on a solstice or equinox at all. If this is a representation of the heavens, it may simply be the configuration of the sky on the date of the making of the pillar or the building or on the day of birth of an important person or day of death or some other significant day within the lifetimes of the makers. That is far more realistic. By the way, in 9500 BCE, around the time carbon dating indicated this enclosure was built, the configuration he proposes with the sun between the head and wing of Sagittarius existed in mid to late September. And I'm sure that would make more sense from a purely archaeological perspective, but from the point of view of an archaeoastronomer, that doesn't make much sense at all. Okay, you've got three handbag symbols there that they're equating with sunrises, and each one has a separate animal next to it. That if you're under the assumption that this is all astronomical symbolism, which this is an archaeoastronomy paper, so shocker, that's the assumption they're operating under. <gasps> then ignoring that part of it is insane. Imagine a five-year-old came to you with a piece of paper with three sunrises or three archways or three handbags drawn on it, and each one has a different animal next to it. You could assume there's some story there, right? I don't think five-year-olds built Gobekli Tepe, so I'm assuming the story is probably a little bit more complex. Furthermore, I know that Dr. Miano is ignoring the fact that these asterisms mean anything because he asserts that Dr. Sweatman just picked old, you know, he was going to call them whatever the hell he needs them to be. But that first one matches Pisces very, very well, right? So 
This is ignoring the data in order to just say, well, you know, I think that maybe it could have represented the death of somebody important. That wouldn't work with the handbags. That would work with the vulture stone. Sure, you could say, well, that the vulture symbol was Sagittarius, kind of, sort of, when you use your version of putting the sun anywhere up in this area and, and calling it. <laughs> when, when you do that, yeah, you could pretty much say whatever you want with it, but... The reality of it is, is that's not at all what an archaeoastronomer would see as is evidenced by the archaeoastronomy paper we're talking about. So we developed a statistical method to try and provide some confidence to this interpretation. If Dr. Swetman had merely provided the interpretation we've seen to this point, it would never have seen the light of day in an academic journal. But this is where it gets interesting. While he himself admits that everything that has been proposed so far has been highly subjective, he has a way to mathematically show that his interpretation is correct. Wow, thank you. Very informative. I gained a lot of knowledge here today. Yes, an archaeoastronomy paper that is not backed up with myth will require mathematics to bear it out or it won't get peer-reviewed. Of course, if you don't know anything about archaeoastronomy, you won't know that. And you'll point out this like it's some big deal. When in reality, as I've already said, they're going to superimpose another culture over the top of it, a la Greeks with the asterism of Scorpio. And now we're talking about Pisces as well, right? And we talked about a couple others in the last one. Yeah, okay. He's gaining more and more momentum as we go along, but you keep pointing out the ones that aren't perfect. That's why he breaks out the mathematics, dude. Big shocker. Uh, it, it, this, is, this is funny. It's like it, you're criticizing the basic methodology of archaeoastronomy, and you're not criticizing archaeoastronomy. You're criticizing Dr. Swetman, but you're not criticizing Dr. Swetman. You're criticizing the basic methodology of archaeoastronomy. You're just pointing that at Dr. Swetman. He has so much confidence in it that in their paper, he and Sikritsis write that no other hypotheses even need be explored. Quote, our basic statistical analysis indicates our astronomical interpretation is very likely to be correct. We are therefore content to limit ourselves to this hypothesis, and logically, we're not required to pursue others." Unquote. Now, I don't know if he's saying this just about himself or about everybody, but it exhibits that same hubris that we were talking about earlier. The magnification and exaggeration of the significance of one's own work or abilities. As we will go on to see, his statistical method doesn't establish what he thinks it does. And now the ignorance mingles with the arrogance and we get the insults in the form of, oh, you know, this is hubris and the man thinks he's way better than he should be. In the archaeoastronomy paper, he says, let me read a little, little bit more there just so you can get the full context. Of course, an astronomical interpretation is not mandated by the presence of the scorpion. One might attempt interpretation instead in terms of hunting or migration patterns, mythology, or any other coherent system or framework. Indeed, we must also consider the possibility that the symbols on Pillar 43 were not interpreted to convey any specific meaning beyond depictions of common animals. However, our basic statistical analysis indicates our astronomical interpretation is very likely to be correct. We are therefore content to limit ourselves to this hypothesis and logically we are not required to follow others. We now describe the evidence and logic for this interpretation. So basically he's saying that they don't need to look into other stuff according to their paper that is looking into archaeoastronomy because they're content with the math that they have done themselves. They're not saying that other people don't need to look into the hypothesis and it's very obvious. Furthermore, they acknowledge that other things could exist, but they feel that their math bears it out that it, that's not the case. They're very clear about that. So the, this misrepresentation is, again, it's like this isn't hubris. This is him saying, I'm confident in our maths here, but you may not be. It, it, there's all these other interpretations that may be there. However, I'm confident in what I've got, so I'm going to continue under the assumptions that these are stars considering that this is an archaeoastronomy paper and not a paper on, say, hunting. If it was a paper on animal hunting, by all means, I would expect him to frame it through the lens of animal hunting. This is how you bear out which hypothesis holds water or not. I mean, come on, man. What's he supposed to do? Write an archaeoastronomy paper and in the first page say, no, it's not archaeoastronomy, game, set, match. 
you bear out each one of these avenues and then you can evaluate them. Or you can just criticize the entire methodology, but not criticize the methodology, criticize the man that's employing it, but the spray that you don't know what the basic definology is. Oh man, it's using all kinds of wrong words. This is how that method works. First of all, we propose that Scorpion does indeed match the Scorpius constellation. We therefore ask, what is the probability of these animal symbols appearing in approximately the right position to represent this date? But this seems to me to be a vain exercise. Dr. Swetman's thesis doesn't rely on which animal symbols appear in the pillar, apart from the scorpion and its relation to the sun. It relies only on what constellations we assume the animal symbols to be. If the vulture were a frog, he would still say it was Sagittarius. If the goose was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, he would still say it was Libra, and so on. He would say, well, this is just a symbolic representation of the order and placement of the stars. He actually does say that in his paper when he acknowledged that the goose doesn't really look like Libra. Dr. Swetman would still equate the symbols, whatever they might be, with the constellations that he does now, because he started with his conclusion and worked his way back. It's not the animals that are in the right positions. It's the constellations that he assumes them to be, but they're not in the right positions either. As you can see. We'll work backwards from this. Those two constellations would be off the goddamn pillar if we did it that way. Look. So, yeah, I suppose they could have wrote them in midair, or like Dr. Sweatman also mentioned in the paper, which I noticed that you forgot to point that out, Dr. Miano, but Dr. Sweatman does say that. It links like they had to kind of scrunch things in a little bit because they ran out of space. But don't worry about that. That's the kind of argument we save when we're talking about the Piri Rees map, right? We don't talk about that. We're talking about Pillar 43. Anyway, let's get into the real meat and potato side of this because, once again, what in the actual fuck? All right. He has superimposed one culture on top of the other, and he has extrapolated these other constellations based on that. He's got a few that are pretty solid matches, and then some that are not so much. The few that are solid matches should be somewhat compelling, but we're just trying to be super duper skeptical, so to hell with all the rest of it, right? So he's going to use some maths here, and you immediately are like, I don't even see the point because blah, blah, blah. He's going to say in a minute, this isn't scientific, isn't he? You're going to play that clip here in just a few seconds. So, what the hell, man? He knows this isn't scientific. This isn't meant to be scientific on this part right here. This is him bearing out if the constellations that he chose seems accurate. Um, think of it like... The same way that the cops can't use a, a lie detector test, like, a, the, excuse me, the lawyers can't use a lie detector test as evidence in court, but the cops can use it as a direction for, like, a compass to know what way to go. That's what Dr. Sweatman's doing here. So why you're just saying, I don't even see the point of this, well, I know why you're saying that, because you don't see the point of this, because you don't fucking get archaeoastronomy. No offense, but... It's pretty obvious at this point that this is just like you just don't understand this or you have zero respect for it and haven't bothered to attack it as a field. Instead, go after Dr. Sweatman, which is really weird to me. But I don't think that's the case. I think that you just don't know what archaeoastronomy is. So the way we can think about that problem is by viewing each of these animal symbols, so the three at the top next to the handbags, or the sunset symbols, plus Ophiuchus, the duck or goose and the dog or wolf and the vulture. So we've got seven other symbols surrounding the scorpion. Let's suppose instead that each of those symbols is replaced by a dice and each dice has 13 sides. Why 13 sides? Well, that's because there are roughly 13 animal symbols, 13 different animal symbols that appear at Quebec Tepe so far. So if we replace each of these animal symbols with a dice, and each dice has 13 sides, and if we throw those seven dice, then the total number of combinations that we can get for all the different animal symbols is in the tens of millions. It's an extremely high number. That means that there are tens of millions of different combinations of animal symbols that could have been placed on this pillar. 
If we're going to remain in the framework of his hypothesis, the number of possible animal symbols should be higher than 13. There could be other symbols that we just haven't found yet. Dr. Swetman himself believes that some of the animal symbols for the constellations are missing here at Gobekli Tepe. He says so explicitly later. If those missing symbols had been part of the constellation system the people here had, then even those could have appeared here, right? I'm going to show you how Dr. Miyano's thinking here is like basically full pyramidian at this point. Um, uh, to draw a quick parallel, how, how old do you think uh, Darren Kuyu is, Dr. Miyano? Like the oldest datable material they find there is probably about when you would attribute it to, right? I mean, you know, if you think about it, it's probably older than that. I mean, the, the, the people that were like first built it probably didn't leave junk laying around. It was probably the people that abandoned the place the left junk laying around, right? So it could have been 100 years or 1,000 years or 10 years. Who knows, right? But we could assume that it was probably older than the, the artifacts that were left there. So what date would you pin on that? What you just want to pick a spitball date? So while Dr. Sweatman's doing his numbers here, what, what number should he pick for other animals? 14? 72? 80,000? What, what are you talking about here? You, you can't just say like, oh, you don't know for sure, therefore you can't do any of this. That's fucking not science, man. That's, that's bullshit. We then ask, well, how many of those different combinations are as good as the one that actually appears on the pillar at representing this date? And in our view, there are only a couple of combinations that are as good as the one that appears on the pillar at representing this date. So that means that the probability of, of achieving this set of animal symbols at random that represents this date so well is tiny. It's, it's about one in 20 million or so. So that's our estimate for the chance that those animal symbols could be placed on this pillar. I think we all can agree the placement of the images aren't random. They are there by design. One in 20 million? Okay. Establishing that the symbols are not put in those positions by chance, however, does not mean they represent a date. They could have been put there deliberately to represent something else. They could represent a hierarchy, they could represent gods, or if we interpreted them spatially, they could represent regions. They could represent different times of the year, rather than one specific date. They could be a mere representation of the sky at sunrise. The hypothesis that this is a date doesn't rely on which animal symbols appear here but rather on what constellations are portrayed. Dr. Miano, it's both the animals and the constellations. As we've already established, having a touchstone when you don't have mythology is standard operating procedure in archaeoastronomy. So Scorpio is his touchstone. That animal is what he has superimposed Greek asterisms over the top of, starting from there and working his way out. When he finds other ones that match up, like Pisces and Lupus, for example, all of a sudden, he, he, he's on the right track. As a matter of fact, he's got four total with 13 animals that are identified, right? That's almost a third, sir. That is, I challenge you to find such a robust set of matching asterisms in any other archaeoastronomy paper where they've been forced to superimpose another culture over the top of each other like this. It, it, it almost never happens. This is this this right here is very compelling to me. As I mentioned before, when I first looked at this, when I first saw this on Ancient Apocalypse, I was just like, Pfft. and I started looking at this, and I was just like, whoa, this is pretty compelling. And you keep missing the major supporting piece of evidence for it actually being a date when that's those three handbags with the different animals next to them. If those represent solstices and equinoxes, which is a very very likely thing, if this whole thing represents stars, that that's extremely likely then yes, it absolutely would be a date, no question about it. So when we've already got so many things, again, one third almost of the of the animals there, he's matched up in, in his stuff compellingly uh, to where you've admitted that they probably, okay, that uh, looks okay. Uh, dude, at this point, at this point, we are at least in the realm of possibility to just disregard it like it's another one of your crystal peddling boneheads that you respond to on TikTok. I, I dare say Dr. Miano is hubris on your part. You have stepped well outside of your realm of expertise and shit all over a man who is doing very good work in a very weird field that not a lot of people do stuff in because of somewhat of this kind of crap right here, I, I would uh, dare say. 
from what the research I've done. And, and you know what? If Dr. Miano doesn't like archaeoastronomy, that's fine. But he should just come out and say so. And then let Dr. Me Dr. Sweatman be redeemed somewhat in the knowledge that Dr. Miano is not attacking him personally. This is just all of that entire field. But as it is, it is completely an attack on Dr. Sweatman. But it's not an attack on Dr. Sweatman, like I keep saying. It's, it's just kind of... It's kind of gross because it's happening in the circle of academia and my dumbass electrician self can, can, can see this plain as day. Now that estimate of 1 in 20 million doesn't take into account the good orientational correlation of these animal symbols around the scorpion. If we take that into account, we get a, a factor of about 1 in 7. And the details of that calculation are in our recent paper. But as we've already seen, they're not properly oriented. And that's if we're generous and say that it doesn't matter that Scorpius is upside down. If Scorpius is assumed to be facing in the correct direction, then all of them are in the wrong spot. Now beyond Scorpius, I would have to take issue with there, Dr. Miano. It seems to me that it's not the orientation that's the problem on the rest of them. It seems to me that the problem with the rest of them is where they're spaced. And again, there's only so much room on that rock and they're going to be flopping off the edge if we put them exactly where you put them in your clip. So I don't really know what we're supposed to do there except for to have them riding them in empty space or to assume that maybe they tried to scrunch things up. And again, when we start matching multiple asterisms, it becomes compelling. If that clock was a little bit oval shaped, we'd still call it a clock, right? You'd still be able to tell what it was doing. Now, of course, that statistical estimate completely depends on our view of how well the animal symbols fit the constellation. When he says how well the animal symbols fit the constellations, he means how well the animal shape matches the outline of the constellation. Man, am I so glad that Dr. Miyato weighed in there because I was under the impression that when Dr. Sweatman said that the animal symbols fit the constellations, that he was saying that the animal symbols were using the constellations as fleshlights. And apart from the logistical problems, which had me staying up at night for many nights in a row, it just seemed a little weird to me. But this, now this makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Miyato. I, now I know what he meant. By so, for example, in my view, this bending bird is the best animal symbol at Quebecu Tepe for fitting to Pisces and that the duck goose is the best animal symbol that fits the constellation Libra and so on. So for example, the eagle vulture is the best animal symbol at Quebecu Tepe for representing Sagittarius. Of course, that's a subjective assessment and you might disagree with that. You might choose uh, different animal symbols. You might think a different animal symbol, for instance, is, is better than the duck goose at representing Libra. He seems to leave out the possibility that someone might think none of the animal symbols fit the pattern of Libra or of Sagittarius. But it turns out that although he doesn't need the symbols to be any particular symbols, he does need the constellations themselves, the asterisms, to be the classical ones. That's because, at least as far as I can determine, the basis of his linkages between the symbols and the constellations is the scorpion representing Scorpius. All the rest of the animals on Pillar 43 hinge on that assumption. But of course, Holding that position means that an explanation is needed as to why the other symbols are different from the classical ones. And he never provides an explanation. Well, again, to that Darren Kuyu metaphor, again, Darren Kuyu is that set of caves in Turkey that is basically undateable, but they found artifacts, so they've dated it to those artifacts. And I'm sure Dr. Miano would agree with that dating approximately. But logic and common sense would say that that dating is probably not quite accurate that the stuff that was left there was probably not left by the original builders it's probably older maybe considerably older than the things that were left there however dr miano is not going to go down the rabbit hole of saying well you know it could be ten thousand years old so we can just make whatever we want but he's going to do that with these asterisms here he's going to do that with the constellations he's going to say you know why not just pick and choose whatever the hell we want that's why he's stuck using the greek ones there dr miano because if I just look up at the night sky, I can draw anything I want. I can draw Dolly Parton. I, I can draw God of War. I can draw anything I want. I can draw Master Chief in freaking Fortnite on the stars if I'm just doing it by myself. And, and, and then I can back that up with a mathematical probability of one to one. Absolutely 100% that that is what that's meant to represent. Because 
Well, there it is. Okay, so I can, you can create whatever asterism you want, and then just make it work. Okay, so that is why Dr. Sweatman has restricted himself to the set of asterisms that came from the Greeks. And then you want to know why, or why they might have changed, and he doesn't explain it. Well, I know that this is probably a complicated thing to understand, being that you're an archaeologist and all, but it was like 10,000 fucking years ago, man. So there's a really good chance that shit has changed since then. However, if you agree more or less with our view, then you too should conclude that Pillar 43 represents a date using precession of the equinoxes. Not so. We not only would have to agree on the meaning of the animal symbols, but also his interpretation of the decapitated head as the sun, and his interpretation that the main image is depicting the summer solstice. Or any solstice or equinox for that matter. By decapitated head, do you mean that round ball that's in the vulture's hand that's completely different looking than the decapitated heads that we do see at the Gobekli Tepe? Uh, I just, well, just wanted to, to check for a friend before we went down the, the rest of the road in this clip. And once again, Dr. Miano ignores the significance of the handbag symbols with the animals next to them. This is compelling evidence for it being a date if these do indeed represent stars. If these represent asterisms and constellations, those three handbags in conjunction with the main stone are very compelling evidence for it being a date. So every time you bring this up and you're like, oh, you need to do this, 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 and you forget those, it's like you're forgetting the linchpin and you're, you're like bringing up all the little pieces on the outline. But that's, that is the one that it's extremely compelling to those of us that have a basic understanding of astronomy. Of course, that's not a scientific result because this is so subjective. This matching of animal symbols to constellations. It's a subjective exercise. Dr. Sweatman, have you presented your Gobekli Tepe stellar arrangement to any professional astronomer groups? Has anyone with a deep knowledge of astronomy or astronomical history critiqued your work? If so, I'd be interested to hear what they had to say. And now while on the surface this might actually seem like a pretty fair question to ask, and it wouldn't be bad to actually have a professional astronomer's weigh in on this kind of thing, but <laughs> you know that, that if you go take an astronomy 101 class you're going to walk out of there with like 10 times the knowledge that the most advanced astronomer on the planet 4,000 years ago had I mean you know that right so you don't need an astronomy expert all you need is somebody that got a fucking 4.0 in astronomy 101 and you're golden now it could be made more scientific agreed now let's see what his solution is in part five of his video series. Now the problem with this interpretation is that it is subjective. So uh, although I designed a statistical method to give support to this interpretation, and we've got a level of confidence of around one in 140 million of being wrong, uh, that statistic is not properly scientific because it depends on my view of the rankings uh, shown here for each animal symbol against each associated constellation. And on a number of other assumptions. Oh, we're just gonna pause the video now to make random digs? Sweet. I don't like your hat. Seriously, I've gone over this a few times now. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You have no idea about the basic methodology here, so you just are like... <sighs> like a monkey throwing shit. And you might not share my view of these rankings. Nevertheless, we would have to uh, disagree very markedly about these pattern matches uh, if this statistic is going to become insignificant. In other words, uh, if you more or less agree with my rankings here in this column, then you should also agree, agree with my interpretation of the animal symbols. Actually, you, you can uh, create your own statistic for this, uh, for the vulture stone, pillar 43. Okay, I will try out this exercise. But I also want to point out that we skipped a step. This exercise assumes that the animals are constellations from the Greek system. By doing this, we aren't assessing the probability that they are the Greek constellations. We're determining the probability that if they were the constellations from the Greek system, how likely would Dr. Sweatman's identifications be? Yes, Doctor, it is an archaeoastronomy paper. And as such, 
crazily enough, it operates under the assumption that the people that could see the sky that made up half of their lived experience would quite frequently use that in their art and that they may have followed this very closely and use that as dates and whatnot. And um, it's a pretty crazy idea. I know. I know. It's um, wild. But yes, when uh, somebody makes an archaeoastronomy paper, they operate under the assumption that the archaeology they're looking at is involved with astronomy. We've jumped ahead in the scientific process. For convenience, I'll be referring to his statistical method as the pareidolia exercise. I don't know if you've heard of pareidolia before, but it refers to the human tendency to see patterns or objects in random stimuli. It's how constellations were invented in the first place. But as you may already know, it is subjective, not objective. And Dr. Sweatman admits to this, so I don't think I'm insulting him by calling it the pareidolia exercise. It involves deciding which animal symbol best fits his chosen constellations. But he's rigged it by limiting it to his own constellations and by limiting how many animal symbols you get to choose from. In order to demonstrate that the notion that the lens of archaeoastronomy here might actually hold water, what Dr. Sweatman is doing is pointing out that you can match a bunch of these and if you get multiples together, as I've already pointed out, like four out of 13 to begin with, we, we can agree on are compelling enough. That, okay, that looks like it. That's a third then he is basically extrapolating from there, do these other ones match well? If you think that maybe that goose that you keep complaining about being Libra, if you think that that maybe shouldn't be there, then maybe you put that somewhere else. And if you do this a bunch and you jumble fuck all of his stuff all up, then mathematically you're going to demonstrate that your opinion says that his subjective opinion was incorrect here, right? So... Again, he's, he's trying to demonstrate this by using pareidolia. Yeah, I, I wouldn't argue with that. But what I would say is that by calling it the pareidolia version, that you're basically kind of painting a, a shitty lens. But, but what I would say is that you're ignoring the fact that he is pinning himself to the Greek asterisms, and he's forcing things to fall in line with that because he can't just run off into the jungle like somebody who doesn't really understand statistics or astronomy might do. And you can do it like this. So first of all, you need to create your own rankings for these seven pattern matches. Okay, these seven here. He's asking us to rank his pattern matches. I don't know about you, but I'm more inclined to make my own pattern matches and let him rank mine. But let's play along. I assume he's asking the viewer to do this because he wants each of us to judge how well his system holds up. The basic form of the calculation is P divided by Q, where Q represents the total number of possible permutations, and P represents the number of permutations better than Dr. Sweatman's. And by a better arrangement, I mean a set of animal symbols that match the constellations that he has chosen better. But note here that the constellations remain constant regardless. They are what he chooses them to be. If you believe that it's possible that the symbols do not represent constellations at all, or that they are constellations but not the Greek ones, or that they are the Greek ones but not the constellations he has chosen for you, then this calculation is meaningless. Since his hypothesis hinges on what constellations the animals represent, not on what animals the constellations represent, I would say it's meaningless anyway. So he picks the constellations that he thinks are the ones that are pertinent and gives the other animal symbols that you can choose from. Now he can include all the other constellations that ever existed and you know we could just step outside of the Greeks. Hell, we could just make up our own constellations and we could just go hog wild with this, right? Yeah, okay. He's limited himself to, to what is his hypothesis. I... I how do you not understand this? Of, of course other options exist. He's handing you the methodology, as you're about to demonstrate, to make other hypotheses with this. He's showing you how it's done. I don't understand why you're like so skeptical, like you're so hard on him about this, because he, he's handing you the tools that you're about to just piss all over, but he's handing you the tools to like follow up on his work. And 
he's showing you, and he says multiple times, this, this isn't a hundred percent for sure. He, this is compelling to him. And if you agree that these constellations match these animal symbols, most likely, then you should probably agree with him that those are meant to be a date. Because of the handbag symbols, man, and the fucking sun that you want to keep calling a skull, even though it's got no goddamn face. So, for example, uh, you would need to look at Sagittarius and the Vulture Eagle and decide what rank the Vulture Eagle is in your view uh, when fitting to Sagittarius. So if you thought like me and Graham Hancock that the Eagle Vulture is the best animal symbol out of these ones here, okay, these are the only ones that you can choose from. There are only 11 here. Earlier he said there were 13 and did a calculation based on the number 13. And he's assuming that there are no animal symbols other than the ones we see at Gobekli Tepe. But as I mentioned earlier, the total number of animal symbols, according to Dr. Swetman, is higher than 13. It looks to me that Dr. Swetman did make a minor error there and did forget two of the uh, animal symbols. Not that it matters a whole ton, considering the way that Dr. Miano is just like disregarding it all anyway, but it, it is an error. Um, have to give him that and again he brings up the fact that there's probably more animal symbols there according to dr sweatman and again i would point out that dr sweatman is working with the animal symbols that we know of and that he has on hand he can't just start throwing x what four thousand other animals every one that got on noah's ark we're talking about atlantis right the great flood right every single animal that got on noah's ark should be in this equation I'm going to send him an email and find out why he wasn't doing that. that that's, that's kind of messed up. Good catch, Dr. Miano. He should have done better there. So if you thought it was the best of these animal symbols for fitting to Sagittarius, then you would put a one here. But if you thought it was the second best, you thought, if you thought there was another animal symbol that was a slightly better fit, then you would put a two here. Or if you thought there were two other animal symbols at like Gebekli Tepe that were better than the eagle vulture at fitting Sagittarius, then you'd put a three here, and so on. And you need to do that for all these seven uh, constellations here with, with a rank beside them. If you or I wanted to do this for our own matches and have him judge ours, we would get to place ones in all the boxes, and it would come out to a probability of one in 140 million. Now let's say that you thought none of the animal symbols fit. What would you put in the box? Ah, uh, not an option. He's forcing you to choose a number. Okay, I've put in my ranks. Very subjective, of course, as anyone's would be. Many of Dr. Sweatman's choices, I don't agree, match the constellations to the best animal, as you can see. And to be clear, I use the configuration of stars, not the lines, okay? The drawn lines there are modern. I, I'm not gonna argue about the rankings or any of the subjective part of this at all. I'm just gonna point out that ignoring the lines and just picking any old patterns of stars is absolute bullshit all right i can make orion look like anything i mean anything i can change it from a rocket ship to a goddamn starship trooper if i want based on drawing lines the way that the exact images that you used from uh stellarium and you were using those elaborated artistic images i can do anything like that if you just let me pick with the stars and just play with them you, if you don't follow some predetermined lines, again, the probability equals one to one for drawing literally anything you want. So this is, um, I, you know, I, I want to be mean about it, but again, this isn't Potholer 54. Um, this is Dr. David Miano. And I don't think that he is a dishonest person. I just think that he's overzealous and that frequently mistakes things for woo that are not woo. So in this case, I will give him the benefit of the doubt, but I'm going to say that this this is just R-O-N-G wrong, sir. You are doing this in a way that is so pedestrian that it looks silly. It looks absolutely silly. It's like taking a connect the dot book and then erasing all the numbers and say, this wasn't supposed to be a leaf at all. This is my wiener. Now, once you've done that, you simply need to multiply all your ranks together and divide by 280 million to get this statistic according to your own view of um, the pattern matches. So in my case, when I multiply all these ranks together, I just get um, two. 
which when divided by 280 million gives a chance of 1 in 140 million of this set of animal symbols being chosen by pure chance, which is so small, it, it means that they were almost certainly chosen deliberately to represent this date using precession of the equinoxes. Wait, I'm confused. He gave us a figure of 140 million before, uh, taking the uh, 1 in 20 million probability of the animal symbols being used and multiplying it by his orientational calculation of 1 in 7, and he got 140 million. So now how did it get to be 280 million? I couldn't find reference to 280 million in either of his papers. According to what he's already said, it should be 140 million, right? His final result here should be 1 in 70 million, not 1 in 140. I would agree that seems to be another mistake on his part. I would point out that if, you know, I had a 1 in 70 million chance of winning a lottery or a 1 in 140 million chance of winning a lottery, it wouldn't influence my buying of the ticket one way or the other. But I do see what you're saying. Um, I hope that you don't use this as like some way to just like completely like misrepresent his math compared to yours at the end of this. That would be terrible. So maybe you'd like to have a go at that yourself and see what you get. Okay, I came up with a total of 249,480. I'm not using his 280 million figure for the total possible number of permutations. Neither am I going to use the 140 million because I don't agree with the orientational correlation uh, chance of 1 in 7. I'm going to go with his original figure of 20 million. So I come out to a probability of 1 in 80. But is this that quick maths they were rapping about a few years ago? I mean, you're comparing your number being divided by 20 million compared to his being divided by 240. And even if all of his ways of getting there are wrong, to compare yours to that is absurd when you're disregarding steps that he took. It's got to... All right. Even even if it's a 240 million, it's like he still used that number. L l let me let me draw a real simple parallel to show you how how silly this is. Say that me and Dr. Miano sat down. I, I'm one of the people that he swiped on for his dating app thing that he likes to make the little shorts about. And and me and him sit down to share a pizza. And we go to the old pizza place and we buy a big old pizza. We order one. But then one of his friends walk in the door and they got two kids with them. And they want to chip in and help buy on that pizza too. And then two more people walk in and they want to chip in and buy on that pizza too. And then two other people walk in that I know. Next thing you know, there's 14 people at this table and they're all going to chip in and buy some of this pizza. But I demand that Dr. Miano pays me for half still because that's where we started. And if you find that your statistic is less than one in a million, like mine is, mine is much less than one in a million, then you should really agree with my interpretation, uh, because to do otherwise would be irrational in a, in a scientific sense. Well, my chance is much greater than one in a million, so nothing notable here. Yep, your chance is better, just like I would have got a smoking deal on that pizza I was just talking about, right? Good maths. Well, I, I wonder why he says later in the response to you that you aren't qualified to handle these kinds of maths. I'm confused. All right, well, I'm going to cut this in a little shorter than I did last time. Um, I, it, I'm tired, man. Sorry. I, I've had a lot going on lately, and it was just 4th of July yesterday, and this will, won't be out till the 6th, and uh, it's getting late as it is. But um, the next video, hopefully, we'll cover the remainder of Dr. Miano's first video on this, and then we'll be able to get into the response. Um, Thank you so much for watching. Continue to do so. Remember to tell your grandma about me. I know that a lot of you haven't done so because I keep looking at the age demographics and there's like literally no 90-year-old women. And I'm like, dude, I ain't trying to date younger than me, all right? So hook it up. Thanks a lot. You guys have a good night.